Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. UCLAN uh, in central Lancashire, um, they recently opened uh, a medical school, um, you know, a proper one for doctors and, you know, just like in competition with some of the other main uh, uh, universities that do that. And they went out and spent an awful lot of money getting top people um, from the, um, the the health world in to actually do the lecturing, and it's made a huge difference. Uh, the reputation for that area now has, uh, has jumped, basically, in, in the last few years. Anyway, I digress. Professionalism is um, an issue which is joined. It is dual professionalism, if you like, because obviously uh, there are differences in the way you approach things as a teacher than you do as in, in, a, in another industry. So, again, it's explain ways in which those professional values influence your own practice in areas of specialism. One of the um, one of the areas that I was in when I was in industry was quality quality control which led me from assessment into IQA, which is, again, it's the same area. It's looking at doing things properly, yeah, mm -hmm. where you have values within yourself that you, you display every time you stand out in front of a group, yeah? And those professional values enhance what you do, yeah? They don't detract from it whatsoever, which was the, the impression I was getting when I first moved into the industry nearly 30 years ago. So that is the big difference between the two. So it's looking at those, and I think if we bring the other the other sheet up, it actually goes over that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we don't need to go through the union. Let's get back to the bit. So here we are, yeah. Professionalism. Autonomy, codes of conduct, roles and responsibilities, concept of leadership, what national bodies stand for and national professional standards and professional recognition and people with higher qualifications. That's not to say that people with higher qualifications are necessarily more professional than people with lesser qualifications. I, well, that's something I firmly believe anyway because I've met both. I've met people with very high qualifications who have a, an extreme sense of professionalism and some that don't. Um, you know, it, it, it all boils down to personality as much as anything else. But dual professionalism, specialist area plus specialist teaching, these are where people like ourselves have, have come from one area into teaching by whatever means. Um, and it's looking at um, how we have actually arrived there. So we're looking at professional bodies. Institute for Learning, is that, I'm not sure that's still there, is it? No. Is it still there? No. That, there I think some, it might be, you know. Yeah, the IFL was brought in, again, uh, whoa, what, no, 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, and it was actually not looked well upon by a lot of teachers because um, it was really leaned on the professionalism sort of thing. And if you don't do it, it got quite authoritarian. Yeah. I think it uh, it was a, it was a, they were either told to quiet it down a bit or something, but the, the the relationship did change over a period of time. Looking at qualified teacher um, learning and skills status and national professional standards, so it's, it's defined the context of professionalism and dual personalism in education and training. There are some stuff. There is some stuff on the VLE uh, for you to have a look at on that. If I just whiz that out of the way. Oops, and that. We've got peace on professionalism and dual personal, professionalism. Um, there's a recording for Unit 4, LO4 and 5, which is later on. Uh, an introduction to wider professional practice. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. There's a, a, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to, you can go into this afterwards yourself, um, but there is a, a PowerPoint on. LO1 that you might find useful if you're going through that as well. And uh, an ebook on the reflective teaching in further and adult education. More, a lot of information in those uh, will help towards 
uh, putting the, these LOs together. Coming back to that, So again, it then moves on rather, and it asks to this this expands uh, expands I should say um, to looking at ways in which social, political, and economic factors have influenced educational policy. Whether you think they have or whether you don't think they have is equally acceptable here. Um, political factors influence educational policy quite, um, how shall I say, quite strongly. Whether you think that's for good or, or bad, it depends on how it's actually worked out for you. Um, I've had instances where political interference, if you like, in certain areas has caused problems. Um, the, the most recent one, of course, was the apprenticeship programs that um, something like three years ago now, um, they decided to bring a levy in for people that wanted to take on an apprentice. And a group of us at a meeting there said that we were going to kill the, system, kill the apprenticeship scheme. And they all poo pooed it and it, they went ahead with it. And of course, it killed the apprenticeship scheme. They're now actually looking at, at, at delivering that differently now. Um, and whether the levy will stay or go, I personally think it's going to go. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. So look at current educational policies, um, educational policies and curric on curriculum and practice in your own area. So again, that's coming back to what you do. So you can write about that. And if there are any factors, of course, which affect what you do, um, then what the, um, I think it was Adele that brought this up um, a few weeks ago when she just started to have a look at four. And she said a lot of the um, cuts in educational budgets meant a difference. She goes into schools um, to, to deliver specific music. Music it is, actually, as well. She, she teaches music. But to special students, students with special educational needs and that sort of thing. Uh, and the, 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 some of the cuts have affected the number of, of schools she's actually going into. So that's an area that... Is, there's no wrong answers here. It's, it's about your impressions of this and what you think about it. Let's have a look what they have to say. 2.1, yeah. Yeah, raising social factors is raising standards, promoting widening participation. Um, well, we always call it the need group. They call it the needs group, which is not in education or training. Um, so it's looking at en engaging underrepresented, gr underrepresented groups, addressing differences in performance between <clears throat> minority groups, and engaging and identifying community c composition and needs, responding to the impact of migration and immigration, and supporting local initiatives. Some of the, some of the factors, um, the social factors on here, have been things like um, Infrastructure has not been big enough to support uh, a particular migration or immigration in a specific area. Um, overall, the system may have been able to cope, but when it gets concentrated into a smaller area, then it, 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 can, it can make um, support services extremely difficult. So again, um, it gives you some ideas on political factors. Um, and economic factors reflecting local employment needs, identifying local and regional skills gaps. One of the things that the um, that adult education budget I was just talking about before uh, with the apprenticeship scheme is it was all um, sort of administered from London. Now um, each devolved area is, is going to get some of this funding to determine what they need from it rather than be dictated to from London. So the, the, the local needs are going to be able to be, um, or the funding is going to go to what the local areas need, rather than, than a national um, sort of experience, that this widening participation. Yes, that will probably be an issue with local funding, but 
maybe not as high uh, priority in some areas and, as, than in others, yeah? Mm. In economic factors, it's reflecting on local employment needs, identifying, um, responding and promoting employment opportunities, partnerships and collaboration, impact of globalisation on business needs, and responding to an evolving and priority sectors, changing workforce, demographics, encouraging, oh, it goes on, yeah, <laughs> encouraging um, investment in areas. A lot of um, a lot of local councils were started to work with the um, what they call chambers of commerce, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and working together rather than than two separate initiatives, uh, and that has, has made a big difference because um, it may be that a business that's a member of the of the chamber needs information on apprenticeships or, or information on training and what's available and the local authority has training providers who have peripatetic assessors that go out into the workplace who can go down and give them that information so they can get first hand exactly what they, what's involved any costs involved what they need to do all of the all of the things that need to be arranged uh, sort of become a one-stop shop in local areas rather than um, different agencies working in different manners. So, so, could I use that, like, in reference to, say, in some of the schools that I work in, um, because there's a lot of children with the English as an additional language, and we put yeah. that on our SEN register. Yeah. And then we create these hubs, like community hubs, where we get parents to come. So we yeah. Can like one hour a week and they we teach them English. The the council will outsource the teacher to teach yeah. them English so that they can be on the same level as their children. Yeah, that's that's happening up here as well, um, funny enough. Um we 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 <laughs> one of my responsibilities is, is is taking over as functional skills and that's getting people up to maths and English at level two. And okay. also the, a lot of the uh I've got like a, a high number of Asian women that's been coming in and they're saying that the, te the children teaching them at home, um, yeah. it's, they want to come in and pick up and, and sort of broaden the language skills. Because many of them have got a spoken language pretty good. You know, they've been here yeah. for a year and it's, it's not, you know, brilliant, but it's, it's well done enough. But the, the, the reading and writing skills are, you know, way behind that. And those are the things yeah. that build up. So yeah, I agree. The, the, uh, there are different different needs in some areas, but some like that uh, probably go right across the uh, right across the country because well, they've I got. Think, I think this is something new that they're starting to integrate into yeah. a lot of schools because they're having this influx of where people that only know each other they'll stay with each other, so they're not growing out of their box. They're not learning the language English language. They're not learning to read it or yeah. We're kind of forcing it on them so that they can help their children, you know? Yeah, the ones I've spoken to, um, it, it, they don't feel they're being forced to do it, not uh, sort of the pressure's on from the family as much as anything else um, to actually improve those skills so that they can yeah. fully integrate with, with, with where they are. So all those things um, can be discussed if you've got specifics on there. Um, looking at, at the first bit is, is a sort of, um, explain ways in which social factors influence educational policy, which is a sort of general thing. And the next bit is analyse the impact of current educational policies on curriculum practice in your own area. So that's what's happened with curriculum, creating curriculum framework, programmes of study, raising school age. Just as you mentioned, then programmes of study will be in school, but also they're broadening those or widening them out now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, promoting literacy and numeracy, um, promoting vocational qualifications, uh, learning for employment and wider skills. The initiatives come and go nationally. Um, some of them are a good idea. Some of them are perhaps less of a good idea. Um, just before I... Error, isn't it? Sorry? There's lots of trial and error that goes on with... Yeah, it, sometimes you've got to look at... Uh, 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 what the cost is of something against what yeah. you've got to get out of it. And they put in, uh, uh, it's about 10 or 11 years ago now, that, uh, um, 
And this is just came out to actually get people that had no qualifications at all, who were actually in a job and working, um, to look at if they could gain a level two qualification at least in the in the area of work where they were. Um, and that was a, um, I think it was called train to gain, some catchphrase like that from the government. Um, and I got quite heavily involved in that, in, in running that and getting people, um, sort of older people, um, to see that the, the value of having that qualification could make the difference between them getting another job and not getting another job if their job was to go. And in fact, one, one company, uh, we took 14 on, and there was about another dozen who were humming and ahhing. And then, about three weeks into the programme, the company announced there were big cutbacks and they may be closing down. And everybody jumped on straight away to get the qualification before they finished. So yeah, there are good, good initiatives um, that that work and are valuable. Um, but again, um, cost is usually a, a, a cost benefit is usually a, an issue all the way across there. Yeah. Yeah. So this are those two, 1.11.2, 2.1, 2.2, are only two assessment criteria, but they're quite big ones. Yeah. They're quite big subjects. So when you put, um, when you've completed two, uh, one, up to 2.2, yeah. Send me the work across, and I'll send you some feedback, yeah? You okay with that, Ben? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, because what, what I'll do, I'll pick up anything that is sort of going off course a little bit and be able to bring it back on, and then when you follow on with the rest of it, um, I'm, because uh, tonight what I want to do is just have a quick look at the, the, the rest of the unit. I don't want to dwell on it. I just want to go through the learning objectives to make sure you've got no issues with anything as we work through it, yeah? Yeah. So 3.1 is looking at the roles of stakeholders and external bodies in educational training. Deepa, you just mentioned there about bringing parents in and, and, and things like that. They then yeah. become stakeholders themselves. And in some areas, um, parents are invited in, not just in um, mainstream school education, but in further education as well. Sometimes parents are brought in, especially on apprentice schemes and things like that, um, because there's still this uh, stigma to a, to a certain extent of apprenticeship schemes, or oh, they're just, they're just, um, they're just working the kids and, and, and not paying them very much. Or, you know, that, that's a lot of parents get that into their head. But mm. when they see exactly what's going on and what they're going to get out of it, uh, and that there is like a, a vocationally related qualification alongside of the actual skills, they then seem to say, oh, I didn't know it was like that. Yeah. But mm. again, it's getting stakeholders in and making sure people get information. Yeah. So looking at external bodies, so parents, students, awarding organisations, employers, further or higher education providers and training providers. There's a, there's a, a not a, a huge difference between higher education providers and training providers now. Because we deliver functional skills um, as well as higher quality, uh, sorry, higher level education, um, we now become a cross between an educa higher education provider and a training provider. Um, so the roles, are, et cetera, building expertise, specialist staff, physical and human resources, as I say, in sometimes, again, looking at costs, they can't afford to bring in, uh, well, some of the schools at Adele Works in anyway, can't afford to bring in or, or pay a full-time uh, music teacher because they haven't got sufficient you know, numbers to actually do it. So they'll bring, mm. they'll bring a specialist in to deliver specific lessons during the week, probably two yeah. or three days a week. Uh, and that's one way of, of, of looking at um, making sure they've got a full curriculum, they can provide the things, but doing it in a different way. <laughs> Again, IT support, marketing, sponsorship or grants, finance, work experience and progression. Um, one of the the, um, the big SEN colleges just south of Manchester have just taken a group. They've just completed actually um, just after Christmas. Uh, they finished the the, um, the full um, 
qualification. And they um, have parents, of course, but they also have um, employers that take them, that, you know, take the kids, they've got somebody with them, obviously, and they give them jobs to do. Uh, and they learn what it's like to be at work, um, which is probably the first time that's happened for them um, because of the, their educational needs. But yeah, that, um, that widening out of, of the number of stakeholders involved in education um, makes quite a difference. So it, it looks at all those things. Um, where's it gone? Yeah, and it's the impact of a, the accountability to those stakeholders. It can have a big, to the teacher, um, outcomes then become an issue. Um, where perhaps they didn't have before, but the pressure for, to be accountable um, from the, the different stakeholders can put added pressure onto the way the curriculum is delivered. So it's again explain how being accountable to stakeholders and external bodies impacts on organisations in education and training. So impact of accountability, meeting targets, qualified and experienced staff, policies and procedures, clarity of reporting, all those things are um, just really um, mind maps for you to have a look at, um, to look at those subjects. And if you want to, you, there's, there's plenty of information on the net actually in these different things. What in organisations have become accountable themselves now um, they have to meet certain standards or, or the, 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 um, the material that is in their qualifications have to meet a particular standard now and they've got to maintain that. One of the things that um, came in recently was that they were being pushed into providing grading um, which is something that a lot of um, providers didn't do. You had a pass or a, you had a pass or you didn't. It's as simple as that. No, they're offering qualifications with the um, merit and distinction in, in not in every section, but in certain sections of the qualification, you'll be offered, if you do this additional work, then you'll be able to achieve a merit. If you do this additional work, yeah. on top of that, you'll then get a distinction. Now, I, I'm rather ambivalent about it. Um, I come from the sort of MBQ side, so you either achieve it or you don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, the, there can be no grey areas. It's certainly in something like maintenance engineering. Um, would you want somebody that has just about passed, or would you want somebody that's got a distinction working on your um, equipment? Yeah. I guess the, the only yeah. exception would be if it was like a creative industry. Because yeah, yeah, be that, like, that's different. Yeah, you've you, you, a different they thing. They still achieved like all of the skills that they need to be able to do something. Yeah. But you just might not like what they've done, whereas you can't deny if the car is working or not. That's just subjective, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I should go around the car and the car goes straight on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like... Um, it, it, who tested the electrics? <laughs> 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 Bang. <laughs> Again, on this one borders on uh, another unit further on. This is explain why it's important to work in partnership with employers and other stakeholders in education and training. Um, this is becoming more relevant today as well as more people get involved. You've got now companies getting involved with schools as well, haven't you? Um, just quite what the, the import of that is, I'm not sure. I'm not read up much on that. I'm just unaware of it, that's all. So, yeah, it's partnerships mainly with employers, ensuring uh, currency and validity to qualifications, workplace assessment, opportunities for sharing resources, liaising to meet student needs, assessment and requirements, minimising risks, um, quality assuring programs and progression opportunities. Most of the qualifications that we deliver at the higher level, um, when they get to level seven with us, they can then do a selection of universities they can then move straight into um, to do a top up and get the full degree. Um, 
one of the things that came out of this qualification is that it's been stated at a level a level five but because i'm used to reading material off the um of the different levels this is certainly brought us on level six it's it's almost a full bachelor's degree this 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 qualification if you look at the amount of work there is in it um it's nine units and they're quite big units some of them are not but but um, most of them are quite quite large units Three point four analyze the impact of being accountable to stakeholders and external bodies uh, on curriculum design and delivery and assessment in your own area of specialism. So where that affects or impinges any of the things you've discussed earlier, impinge on what you do and how that do it. Just need that uh, an analysis of how that works. Again, the others are just the explain and explain. The last bit is and I'll analyze what all that does to you as a teacher, yeah? Or has the potential to do, yeah? Mm. Yeah. Now this one again is a bit more general. It's uh, looking at explaining the key aspects of policies, codes of practice and guidelines in an organization. So it, it re you really need to look at um, what the QA is, uh, within you were where you're working at the moment yeah um what the policy manual is what the policies and procedures are um what the responses are to the new common inspection framework and the identified roles and responsibilities um observations of teaching assessment policies learner support provision sharing and supporting best practice and integrated approaches and staff satisfaction all of these have to be measured in some way uh, and somehow recorded um, and a lot of organizations now have put particular documents out to find out what staff satisfaction is like to get feedback from um, people on what they think within the common inspection framework managers are starting to put out to staff um, when you do a self-assessment report before an inspection happens um, they're getting staff involved in the SAR now rather than just doing it from a management point of view. So this is all about how an organisation works and how, what they, how, how it's managed, if you like. Yeah. Um, I'm working with a, um, a school in London that's got um, a bad report from Ofsted and we're putting a plan together to turn that round in the next six months. And it's all about, in some instances, uh, the inspection can be quite subjective and there are, they are putting things in place now which allow you to come back on that rather than just say, well, that's your inspection report. Yeah, they give you like a certain amount of time to fix it up and then you, you go back and reassess it basically, don't you? Well, yeah, that, that's they, they, you can do that, but you, you, what needs to happen um, in any instance like that is that you've got to have basically a management meeting and say where do we want to go from here and then say right well how are we going to get there and yeah. it may it may mean bringing people like me and just have a look at what they've done and say well yeah what about this and what about that have you done this what have we got that how do you record this where do you store that how do you look at this asking management questions really of, of how they're doing something uh, it, it makes them think, oh, hang on. In fact, I, I was in one in Leeds that was it was absolutely horrendously paper-based when most of it should have been electronically based and they just needed to get somebody in to set that up. And once they got that done, then they could never find anything. <laughs> it was just chaos. The, 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 the management of it was chaos. But anyway, um, they're on the mend as well now. So it's looking at the um, key aspects of policy codes and practice, and understanding the organisational contacts of educational training, and ostensibly the management of it. Yeah. Again, analysing the impact of those requirements and expectations on curriculum practice in your own area. Yeah. And five one analyze the quality improvement and quality assurance arrangements in your own organization 
So <clears throat> any organisation that you work with or are working in, even if it's temporarily or whatever, uh, it's just having a, a look at their policies and what they involve. Yeah. How did um, one of the things that a lot of um, organisations don't do very well is um, quality assurance, and that is having standardisation meetings um, on a fairly regular basis that make sure the um, best is assessed fairly and across the board. Um, one of the um, one of the issues is that assessors sometimes are brought in by organisations, they don't actually work for them, they just contract to them, and they gave them a lot of portfolios to, prom to, to promote, and then they send them in, somebody else looks at them as far as quality is concerned and says, oh, this is useless, and the guy's gone, he's off somewhere else, and then they've got to try and unpick that and resort it all out. So um, having proper codes of practice um, and proper... I mean, one of the things they do, you see, is once if you have right, I've got six portfolios, you owe me so much money, there's my invoice, get your money and you go. Now, one of the things I've advised companies to do, you don't pay any money out until you've got a completed portfolio, not one that's just been sent in. It needs to have been assessed properly, you need to have the assessment records, and it needs to be IQA'd before you can say, yeah, that's fine. So having those procedures in place um, and making sure they're there, it really needs you to look at your organisational ones and what they've got, uh, and then you can put them what you think of them. So is that like when they do the staff questionnaires and they ask uh, for your response? Sorry, again? You know when they do staff questionnaires? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that is that what you mean by analysing the quality improvement? No, no. That, well, that's part of it. Yeah, that's part of the. It's part of the policy for, for for getting that information. But what I'm saying is, you need to look at the quality manual, if you like, within the organisation that you work with, or an organisation that you work for. Um, so would that be like at school they focus on teaching yeah, and yeah. learning? Would they you will have somebody to? in a school that is responsible for. Um, basically uh, managing the, the quality of the programmes. And that okay. person will is the person you need to contact, really. They're the best yeah, person. The literacy to. phase leader or the numeracy phase leader or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and they will tell you what their policies are, what they've got in place to actually fulfil um, the necessary, necessary uh, requirements for inspection, um, common inspection framework. It, okay. it, there are certain things you have to have in place, yeah? And it's no good going for an inspection without them because you'll just get turned down. So yeah. would that also be like in accordance to the national curriculum as well? That's what they'll be referring to. What needs to be taught at the certain ages, isn't it? Not necessarily what is taught. This is looking at how it is taught and what is the quality of it. Yeah. Yeah. And what what policies and procedures they've got in place to make sure that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Self-assessment, informal sessions, explain the functions of self-assessment and self-evaluation in the quality cycle. And that is part of what, before you get inspected, an organisation has to do an SAR and send it to them before the inspection takes place. Mm. And that's, yeah. that's an organisation saying, yeah, this is where we are, yeah? There'll be good bits in there and bad bits in there. But this is our SAR, self-assessment report. So you need to evaluate a learning programme with learner surveys, focus groups, formal and learner formal, oh, start again, formal and informal learner feedback, team reviews, early reviews, checking meeting expectations, on program to ensure satisfaction, all those things, that, the documents that are collected, the ones like you just mentioned, they'll do uh, staff surveys, um, sometimes they'll do student surveys as well, to actually document 
what they've done about it, yeah? And then it, within your organisation, oh, yeah, quality maintenance of your own organisation, identify any areas for improvement. Well, the easiest thing to do that is to, if you've got, <coughs> excuse me, if you're in an organisation, try and get a hold of the latest SAR. Yeah? That will tell you exactly what's good, what isn't good, and you can then, also, from that, you can identify the areas for improvement. Uh, so that makes that pearl of strength. Hey, so in fact, you said that down here. Student progression data, self-assessment report. That is the major thing. In, in that, that tells you exactly where you're up to, basically, or it should do. So would that be a school improvement plan? Well, is that what an SAR no, is? No, an SAR is saying we've checked everything. We're good at this. We're not too good at that. That that's that's okay but could, could improve. This is absolutely brilliant, yeah? It's looking at all the different things that, you, that, that are done within the organisation and, and saying what they are. It's not, not a plan, it's a report. It's, it's, it's saying exactly it's what you are. It's like a reflection on the year exactly. that you have. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right, Ben. It, it is a reflection of where we are, yeah? That will then trigger a number of things. If you've got an inspection due, um, as a manager, if you've got major issues within the, the SAR, I would be contacting the um, inspection regime and asking for some more time because you've, on the SAR you've found issues that you need to put in place. Usually they will then say, oh, it's fine. Um, you'll get a new date or whatever. Um, but it's then, after you've done the SAR, that's when you can put an improvement plan together. Yeah. Because from the SAR, you'll then say, yeah, well, we need to do that. That needs to be done. That's not in place. That's not in place. Um, and then <clears throat> once you've done that, you've got the plan out. And the people involved then in the different sections who, who've got things to do will have to get those sorted out. I think it was um, uh, <clears throat> about, I think it was December, I put one into the the, uh, the, the company down in London. They've got... They've, Got an improvement plan they're working towards now. So, and then that was it basically. Um, any areas for improvement, plan any changes in delivery approaches, new delivery techniques, development of resources, use of new technologies or online resources, and more flexible approaches to improve access uh, to program and opportunities for staff development, working with stakeholders. All those things again, just amplification thoughts about areas that you could look at. So anyway, I, I'm not going to go too deep there. I'm just giving you a, a read through there. Um, what I need you to do is first, is come back to where we were, and go back to, oops, near there. 1.1.2, 2.1, 2.2, and focus on those and get those complete. And once you've done your first draft on the send them through. Uh, uh, it, it's working, by the way. Now you don't need to send them straight through to my email. Now you send them through to learnerwork at yeah. ukversity.co.uk. Uh, those are actually get forwarded straight to me now. Um, and usually, if I've not got too high a load on of IQA, I'll respond as soon as I can on those and send some stuff back. In the meantime, of course, if you've got any specific questions that you're not sure about, either email me or um, text me. You've got my phone number. Uh, just send a text if you've got an issue, and I'll hopefully be able to help. Brilliant. Have we got any further questions this evening? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm all right. No. It's okay, Beb. Yeah. The, the first well, can I leave that with you? Time. Yeah. Sorry. Can I leave that with you then? No? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank yeah. you. It'll, if we work through it this way, I'll, this is the intention to, to run through on this. I've, I've been learning that as I've been delivering different ones to different groups. Uh, one of the ones that I've mentioned to Deepa before was to do Unit 3 first. That's worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the one I'm tackling now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that has worked um, because it, it'll, it'll cross-reference into the others. Ones that you've already done, actually, but it will cross-reference into the other. Um, also, 
putting the two first learning objectives together first and then sending them in for a, a form, formative assessment. Uh, that is working really well now because then when the rest of it comes in, it's usually okay. I'll just, you know, mind Do you mean the first, the first two in unit four? Yeah. Okay. First two learning objectives in unit four and then send those two. I'll give you some feedback on those and it'll either be, yeah, that's fine, carry on as you are, or there's a couple of points here, you just need to do this, this and this. And that then sets you on the trend for what you need to do. As I've said, the stuff on the VLE, anything that's not yeah. there, um, I mean, I, I use Google quite a lot myself, but also come back to me if you've got a specific issue that you're not sure about or you need some further information on. Okay. Okay? Yeah, great. Right, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for attending. And Bye. I will see you again next week. Bye now. Nice to meet you, Peter. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.